Hello and welcome to yet another episode of C++ for Games. In uh, this episode, we are... Wait, let's do a, let's do a round call here. In uh, this... Oh, great. I don't have the member list here. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm prepared. I'm totally prepared. So welcome. Welcome to the channel. Uh, Hightap, uh, Cynic, Dami, Alex, also known as Stained, Luke, Tetroit, and Thamperer. Woo! Yeah. All right. So <laughs> great. Thank you. But yeah, adjust your soundboard volume. Okay, cool. Maybe later. All right. But anyways, um, without further ado, yeah, let's just uh, stay on topic. First of all, uh, well, might as well go through questions. Does anybody have questions? Uh, please don't ask me uh, <laughs> if you can do your intakes online. Some people asked me that already. You can, but you have to ask for doing the... Uh, intake interviews online or live in person. Of course, we prefer live in person, always preference. You know, we want to have, you know, face-to-face -face conversations with real people, not just talking heads. But um, yeah, any questions? Yeah, I got a quick one. Okay. So in the email, it says between nine and 12, do we just come at 12 and possibly wait two hours before you get a chance to talk or yes so you're in a group right you know, i guess you're going to be grouped up with some other intake uh interviews so mm -hmm. it's just a time range so if you're like morning just so be there at nine because you could be the first person asked to come in mm -hmm. and if you're not then you just have to sit there and wait nervously for your turn okay yeah, I'm sorry, because uh, uh, we can't schedule the, well, we can, I guess. But you know what? People will come in late or, you know, they miss their appointment. And then, you know, we'd rather say, okay, bring in the next one and we'll, you know, the guy who's late, we'll come, you know, get to him later. So I think uh, that's really, yeah, for everybody's time, it's a little bit more reasonable to just give you a time slot than, um, you know, specific time frames. Because if you can't make that specific time frame, then we have to reschedule everything. So if you can't be right there at right at nine or whatever, yeah, we might call you in and be like, okay, if you're not here, then we go on to the next person. But just okay, make yeah, sure that, sense. yeah, you, yeah, if you are really late, that you make sure somebody on somebody knows because we might have called you. All right. And I'm not doing the intake interviews, by the way. I'm not on the schedule for it. My fine colleagues will be uh, interviewing you in the intake interviews. Yes. So yeah, just come during the time slot that you're scheduled for. Okay. Any other questions that I can't really answer properly? <laughs> yeah, there's a whole team behind the intake uh, process, and um, the only part I have is is you know assigning the people who will be doing the intake process. Delegate. I'm not doing it. You do it. That's what I said. <laughs> No, actually, I did the uh, some of the preliminary assessments. And Alex, by the way, you got a um, a very good reaction from the preliminary assessment from somebody who's usually very critical and negative. So congratulations on that one. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's interesting to hear. Yeah. Yeah, I think, who did I do? I, I did, uh, I didn't do Luke. Luke, you had head soccer, right? Yeah, that yeah, was his game. Yeah. And Detroit, you had the the beat one? Mm, yes, I am. Yeah, you, okay. Then I reviewed yours. I also, reviewed How did it go? It well, nice you got an interview, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I got invited. <laughs> then it went well. <laughs> well. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't play your game. I, I, I think I shared a video of me um, just letting the the uh, you know i just dis disabled collisions in the game so i could actually progress past the first stage i couldn't even get to the first checkpoint to be honest because i was like oh, you know i told you i was going to be bad at it so i just disabled I collisions five checkpoints in uh, of uh, an official version which i submitted sorry what checkpoints uh, i submitted the version with five checkpoints so yeah i couldn't even get to the first one much easier oh. 
<laughs> but I wanted to see further than the first checkpoint, so I just you know disabled collisions and let it go. I'm kind of but, yeah. the second level though. Second level, oh my gosh. I can't even get to the first one. But anyways, um without further ado, uh oh sorry. Um anyone else with a question? No, okay, then let's uh, move on to the uh, topic at hand. Um, lambdas, let's see, start from current slide. Let's go here. Can you guys see that? Just make sure this is coming in the stream, yep. Um, you can see that, but I didn't get my presenter view. Where is my presenter view? Why didn't I get that? Oh, because I didn't check his presenter view. How did that get unchecked? Oh, stupid. Okay. Let me start. <laughs> Let me start from here. Oh, this thing is so annoying. If I don't, it doesn't matter. I can see my uh, my notes, but I want to have them on my main screen, not on the side. Okay, now it's being stupid. Hold on. From current. There we go. Now I have my presenter view. Okay, C++, yeah, C++ games is the course that I'm building. And we'll, uh, yeah, we'll go live with that in September, I go hope. But anyways, um, this topic is about lambdas. Uh, lambda expressions. And what are they? Oh my gosh. Please tell me what they are. Okay. So lambda expressions are, uh, I'll basically allow you to define an anonymous or unnamed function object that can be passed as an argument to another function, stored in a variable, or returned as a result of a calling function. So this is actually like part of functional programming. Ah, yes, uh, we talked about that. Functional programming, basically uh, functions uh, are first order objects or first class objects, and they can be treated as a simple object like an instance to a class or or an instance to a variable for example and uh, you can pass them around and you can call functions from functions and it's uh, uh, yeah it makes c++ more functional than it uh, previously was not that we didn't have function pointers before but now we have a nice easy and succinct way of defining in place functions so yeah, lambdas, like I said before, are known as first class object and is one of the fundamental concepts in functional programming. Lambdas are often called closures in other programming languages because they can capture other variables from the local environment and close them. A lambda expression is introduced with the lambda initializers. It's a set of square brackets, as you see on the slide here. Let's see if I got my pen. I should get my laser pointer out. Laser. So these are the square brackets, obviously. And if the lambda takes any arguments, they are listed next, just like a regular function parameter list. And if the lambda doesn't take any arguments, then the empty parentheses are optional. Uh, so these parentheses here that you see in the expression down here, if the, you didn't have any uh, parameters being passed to the lambda expression, then you can just omit the parentheses and just have the function body. All right, the lambda body is surrounded by the curly braces, similar to any other function, and may contain any number of statements, including an optional return statement. Right, so if the lambda doesn't return anything, then uh, you don't need to have a return statement necessarily. Um, but if you do have a return statement, the return value, as you can see, we haven't uh, listed it here. We can do a uh, what's called a trailing return type, I think, on a Lambda, but the compiler will determine the return value of the Lambda based on the return statement, similar to auto return type. Uh, yeah, so the return type is deduced based on the return value. In this case, the return type is integer because int or x is an int, y is an int, and the result of the uh, addition is an integer. And the return value is optional. If it is omitted, the return type of the Lambda is void obviously oh i don't know uh, should we look at the yeah we kind of talked about each one uh lambda initializer must always occur even uh if there are no what's, what's called no captures it doesn't matter parameter list is optional if there are no parameters to it you can omit and the lambda body which is definitely always required but the return statement is optional 
OK, so as I mentioned on the first slide, lambdas are first class objects in C++. And that means that the result of a lambda expression can be stored in a variable, or passed to a function, or returned from a function. The type of the lambda is compiler defined. So for example, the, the resulting type of this lambda expression and how we store it in the variable could be different depending on the type of compiler you're using. So it's very platform specific. So because of that, we can't really name the type of the lambda, right? So for this reason, we must use the auto keyword to represent the actual type that is the result of a lambda expression. And there are ways around this, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, OK, no notes on this one, but all right. So in this example, we see that in order to return a lambda from a function, for example, a function that can return a uh, create a lambda, which is you know kind of common in functional programming. It's weird, but since we can't name the type of the return value, we have to use the auto the auto keyword for the return type in uh, C plus plus. You can also uh, pass a lambda object to a function. Uh, in this case, we can use the auto keyword again, as you can see here, where we have the use lambda example, we have auto f, and then the parameters that we want to invoke. Uh, it's not extremely clear that f is actually a uh, callable function object, but we have to know that, all right? Um, so as you know from the previous lesson, this creates an abbreviated function template, um, right? So I think we talked about templates, and we talked about function templates, and uh, did, uh, did I talk about abbreviated function template? I don't know if I talked about that, but anyway, so we can just use auto on the on the past parameters to basically create a template function where, well, it's an unnamed type. We don't have an, a type for it, but that's what we have decal type for to actually get at the type of F, which again is compiler defined. But I'm not a big fan of this syntax because auto is not really self-documenting, right? In this context, we don't know what f should be. And so a better way of passing a function to, um, oh, passing a function pointer basically is to use the std function object. This more clearly indicates uh, what, the, what the actual type is. Later in this lesson, we'll also see how we can fix the syntax to make it more clear uh, what kind of object the use lambda function can expect. So we'll improve this one later. So that's one way of passing lambdas because we can't name their type, but std function provides us with a more, let's say, doc self documenting type. All right, so a generic lambda is a lambda expression with at least one auto parameter. So in this case, you can see that x and y are both auto types. So this is very similar to the abbreviated function templates. And this creates a function template where the function parameter types are deduced based on the context in which it is used. I remember from the previous lesson that we can also use the const auto references to eliminate n any unnecessary copies. Uh, so if you remember from, I think it was not on function, function templates per se, but in one of the lessons, I think we talked about auto keyword does not deduce uh, const or references. So if we want to turn this into a, you know, a copy by reference or pass by reference, then we have to explicitly add the ampersand on the auto to make it a reference. If we want to make it an uh, immutable reference, then we have to add const auto reference. Okay. So the capture clause, this is the, um, in the square brackets, it's called the capture clause. Uh, this is placed inside, yeah, the lambda initializer. So it's placed inside the lambda, lambda initializer. And there are two default capture clauses that you can use to automatically capture local variables within the lambda. So the equal sign, as you see in the first example used in this lambda initializer, will cause any locally defined variables used within the lambda body to be captured by value. So um, do I actually explain this example? Yeah. Um, so in this case, we have a, um, a function which takes two variables, x and y. And then we use the equal sign to say, let's capture x and y in this scope 
by value. So when we use X and Y here, we're actually using the X and Y that were passed to the function called create capture. What we get back is a Lambda, which captured the, the values that were passed to the function by value. Oh, yeah, it might seem a little bit complicated now, but uh, um, yeah, there's some gotchas about this. Well, we'll get to that in a second. Well, by value, there's almost no no issues except that you're copying the values uh, into the into the lambda lambda, but by reference there can be some gotchas. Um, yeah, so then when you invoke the lambda in this case, when you invoke this lambda later that gets returned from the function, it will be invoked with the values that were passed to the function. I hope that's clear. The ampersand can be used in the lambda initializer to capture variables by reference. Now, since the variables are now aliases of the original variables, if the values are changed, then the Lambda will see these changes when it is invoked. But be careful when you are capturing variables by reference. You're only creating an alias to the original variable. If the captured variable goes out of scope or is destroyed before the Lambda is invoked, chaos ensues. So to be clear, right? So X and Y are passed to, the, to this function by value right? They're captured by reference inside the Lambda initializer. And then they're later executed or they're evaluated when the actual Lambda is invoked. But if you return a uh, the Lambda expression from the function, then this stack is unwound. And these variables, which are captured by reference, are no longer there. So this is really bad. This is okay. This will work. This is not okay. The actual values that you capture by reference in that local scope must exist when the Lambda is invoked. Okay, I've seen a lot of cases where students have made this mistake and then they get a crash and they have no idea what's going on. And it, it yeah, to the untrained eye or the untrained professional, they would really be super hard or impossible to figure out what's going wrong. Unless you know, yeah, captured by reference, those variables have to stay in scope or in existence for as long as the Lambda does. Okay. Um, yeah, but I think I said everything there. Okay, you can also capture certain local variables explicitly by naming the variable in the capture clause. So in the Lambda initializer, um, you can capture the variables by reference if you append an ampersand. So in this case, we're explicitly capturing X and Y by reference. And in this case, we're explicitly capturing X and Y from the local scope by value. Uh, of course, you can also capture some variables by value and some by reference if you want to. But again, be aware of the scope and lifetime of variables captured by reference. So remember a few slides back when I said that I didn't like using abbreviated function templates notations for passing lambdas to functions? So one of the solutions that I suggested was to use the std function object, but how exactly can we formulate this? The standard template library provides the std function type to store callable function objects. And to use it, we must be able to define the expected function as a template argument to std function. Uh, uh, yeah, as a function, the template argument to the std function defined in the functional header file, right? So we need the functional header file because std function is defined there. And in the original example, we used auto. So this was the original example to create an abbreviated function template to allow an unspecified lambda to, lambda to be passed to the function. Using the six syntax, it is not immediately clear what type of f is. Right, so if I was looking at the code, I would be like, what? If I didn't see the implementation, I wouldn't know what F is supposed to be, unless it was somehow you know, really well documented. You really need to analyze how it's used in order to decipher what it is. Now, if you're working in a team with other programmers and you don't document your functions, well, then I don't think that they're gonna appreciate this kind of code where you just have auto F and they're just gonna go, what the F is F? A more descriptive syntax would be to explicitly state the type of argument you are expecting. But when using lambdas, yeah, that's not so easy, right? Because they're platform specific, the actual type that gets generated by a lambda expression. 
And the std function template allows you to clearly indicate the type of the variable that is expected here. In this case, it's a function that takes two integers and returns an integer. Not only is it more clear now what kind of variable is being expected here, but you can also pass other types of callable function ob objects. For example, a pointer to a function, a function object, or a lambda. So we'll have, we'll have some examples of uh, <clears throat> these differences in a second. But that's kind of it, right? That's lambdas in a nutshell. Uh, we, we showed the other types of captures, but you can mix and match. So for example, you could capture X by value and Y by reference. You can also mix defaults uh, with capture by reference. So for example, you can say, I want everything else by default, but I want Y to be a reference. So you can also mix those. I didn't explicitly state that, but uh, now I did. Um, so yeah, uh, in this lesson we learned about Lambda Expression. You learned that Lambdas allow functions to be treated as a first-class object in C++. You also learned that generic Lambdas can be defined using the same syntax as the abbreviated function templates uh, that we saw in the function template lesson. Yeah, you also learned that you can capture local variables either by value or by reference by using the capture clause. And finally, you learned a little bit about the std fun function template type that is less ambiguous than auto and can be used to store the result of a Lambda expression. If you'd like to learn more about Lambdas, I recommend you read chapter 19 of the beginning C++ 20 from novice to professional. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm using this book as a reference for most of the foundational uh, uh, lessons in the C++ for games course. And after that, uh, we get an SD, uh, standard template library stuff, and then it's yeah, it doesn't really go into that much depth. But I do recommend this book. I, I was pretty good for learning uh, C++ 20, the modern programming way. Additionally, you can also consult the C++ language reference on Lambda expressions on cppreference.com. Okay, that was it. Um, any questions about that? Um. What about the pitfalls of using SAD function? Oh, there are so many. Where do I start? Um, yeah, what are the pitfalls? <laughs> like, <laughs> you state it as an easy alternative to just replace the auto and make your code clearer, but yeah. Are, are, but it aren't needs, there it needs memory for about? the. Sorry? Aren't there things one should uh, think about? When well, that they, they allocate? Uh, for example, yeah. Uh huh. Or potentially allocate. Okay, they potentially allocate. Yes. Can you pass an allocator to an STD function object? Uh, I'm actually not sure. Can you override global um, global new and global delete to oh, to change yeah. how STD function allocates? For an SD function, yeah. I'm actually not sure about that. Does it allocate on the heap or does it allocate on the stack when they're uh, when heap. they're passed by value? Sure. Heap? You think, I think so? so? Yeah. I'd have to check this. Does the standard say anything about it? Um, I don't think. Well, actually, it states that uh, SD function may allocate. It doesn't specify anything really about it, but I don't think there's any way to specifically allocate on the stack without causing a lot of issues. Because, hmm. like, I think SD function only potentially allocates if there are captures. Like, if there are no captures, it shouldn't allocate. And it might you also mean if, on if the resulting many. lambda has, you know, has a size? Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so if it doesn't, then it doesn't allocate. But it still needs to store something. Well, a plain lambda is or the uh, function one object. Byte. Sorry? A plain lambda is uh, one byte big. One byte? Yeah. Uh, and okay. well, I actually um, talked about this a while ago. Here's a Godbolt link. Okay. 
uh, showing you some function sizes. All right. And I have to show this on the screen. Can you guys see this? Size of so okay, the free function is a is a, fun, a pointer to a function. I assume. Uh, you have yeah. size of free function where size of free function. Oh, you have it all printed out in one line. Okay. Size of member function sixteen, because that is a a pointer to an instance, right? So you need a pointer for the instance and a pointer to the actual function. I assume. Uh, not sure, but I think the vtable is involved there. No, uh, well, wait a that second. No, it's just a normal one. Who's a struct with no virtuals? Yeah. So I don't think there would be a vtable there. Uh, I think it's the pointer to the instance and a pointer to the func to the actual function. Well, you you have to supply the context, right, when you call a member function. So it doesn't make sense to store the instance. Well, you're just checking the instance of a member function of a class, the size of a pointer to a mem member function of a class. Yeah. Right. And here, blah. Or sorry, bar. So I can't keep on my screen at the same time, but. Uh, blah has a vir uh, virtual constructor. Oh wait, the function is called the struct is called bar, and it has blah. Has the same size. So a member function to a uh, for a virtual class has the same size as a standard member function. Right. So these are compiler specific, so they might change. And this is a lambda with no captures. And it's okay. One byte, sure. Okay, what is being stored there? We have no idea. Um, and a and a capture with a closure, which has i, j, k, which are all integers i, j, k, and l. Um, i, j, k, and l. So you have the ampersand here, but then you explicitly state all of the. Oh wait, yeah. You're, okay, you're also capturing ba lambda by reference because it's not explicitly stated in the lambda initializer in the capture clause. Uh, and local struct member, local foo, local foo, which is here, local struct. Why would it be a different size? Sixteen, because it's also a member function. Okay, so and the size one, you, is this, uh, if we change the compiler, does that change the result? I'm not sure, actually. Uh, can be. I choose MSVC? Yes, I can. Let's go latest. Yeah, it won't print, though, because MSV doesn't execute. Oh, it doesn't execute. I mean, you can deduct it from the assembly, but it's a bit... Well, you can see the sizes in there, right? Where? Here? Uh, yeah. Cloud Lambda <laughs> closure size is 20. These are the size of the variables, so the, uh, I guess. So the lambda with the uh, and captures are 20 bytes big. So that already differs. Yeah. Um, but I don't know what T1 is. Well, I don't know. <laughs> but it says also size is one for this, and this one says size is one for that, blah, lambda. So honestly, I pff, no clue what, why, what's one by, like what's being stored there? What's one byte? Okay, an interesting stroll down um, C plus plus lane. Um, but bottom line is, I mean, which one is more clear? If you only saw this in a header file, which one would be more clear? Oh, definitely. Is it worth? The fact that std function might be uh, 16 bytes, where a lambda would be one byte, is the trade-off worth it? I would say so. Can you using the lambda declaration 
Yeah, so what I'll, I think I've got an example where uh, we have a few ways of using it. So for example, let's see, I think I have a for each which takes a function pointer um, I, and I passing you, uh, a lambda function where a function pointer is being used. So I'll show a couple different examples of how we can use lambdas and we can pass them either as a function pointer uh, or as an auto. We can create capture, oh, as std function. Yeah, so let's take a look at examples. Without getting, sorry, but without getting too tangled up in the, you know, allocations and whatever, we wanna keep it beginning C++, that's the name of the chat, beginning C++. Yeah, I, I was wondering if you could using it and stuff like, like a type def, basically, if that's possible. That would create a type for it, but I'm not sure you I can. I would challenge you to create a using statement that defines a lambda. Now, that yeah, what I would suggest is that you define it as either a function pointer or as a std function object. That's what I would do because, like we said, lambdas can't really you can't specify the type of a lambda. So in order to store it on a variable, you have to use auto or store it into something else that can uh, represent a callable function object like std function which is what it's used for or made for well one of the many uses of it um yeah what is the std function can only not um ex like easily store functions or yeah functions to an instance of a class so for that you need to bind you need to use binding uh, semantics but i'm, I'm not going to get into bind today I think. Let's just see an example. And we'll see, I think, yeah, I have an example here where it's being used as a callable, uh, as a function pointer. So we'll talk about that too. First of all, I'll just create a simple demo with an empty project. Uh, let me just create a new project here before I bring it on the screen. Empty, I'll just start with a blank slate. I'll call it lambdas. I'm just doing this off screen for a second. Lambdas. We just stop the presentation now. Don't think there are any more slides now. Uh, stop. Stop. Okay. And then I think this is loaded up now. So empty project. We'll just create a new item for main. Oh, this is a new interface. Okay. Cool. I only need IO stream just for printing stuff to the screen. Do I need to? No, I'll leave it for now. And make sure that the minimal program compiles and runs. I don't believe it will go off screen. I'm just going to turn on an option to keep it from disappearing. So that's under the debugging. Then automatically close. I want to turn that off because I want it to be still that I can move it on the screen before it disappears. Okay. So what I want to talk about first, we'll, we'll keep, keep to a very simple function signature, something that takes a few parameters, but also returns something. So if I wanted to create a, a pointer to an, an a function that takes two integers and returns an integer, I could do this. I could say using, um, I don't know what to call it. Uh, what do you call it? This is a type. So T, F, P, T, I don't know, funk. So let me say int. Uh, and in this case, because it's a, it's already an alias, we can just go with this, int, int. I believe that is a syntax to define a pointer a type, which is a pointer to a function which takes two integers and returns an integer. Okay, so just to be clear, like this is a function pointer. Well, just a type def of a function pointer. And let's say we have a very simple function which takes two integers and just adds them and returns it and returns the integer. A, B. 
So this is just a free function that just returns the result of A plus B. Yes? Um, let's see what else. Um, this is a more complex example. But let's take a, another example here where we can uh, iterate over a list of integers and, perf and perform a function on them. So this could be kind of anything. And since we talked about templates last time, let's use a template for this and write a function. Okay, I think I'm gonna need C++ 20, was that in span? It's here, but I think we need uh, C++ 20 for this. So let's upgrade our project to for all configurations, all platforms. Why are you still creating a 32-bit platform? Whatever, that's the template, um, the Visual Studio template, I should say. Not that one, this one. Let's go 20. Okay, that should get rid of the red. And these are the values. And then we're gonna pass, well, I'm gonna be more explicit here. I'm gonna pass the actual type here. It's just to be more explicit, but I just wanna say, this is how we would type def in a function pointer. Now, I don't know how to type def, for example, uh, lambda func, I don't know, right? Like, what would the type def for this be? I think that's what you're asking, right, Themper? I think so. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so how would we type def a, a lambda, all right? So, I don't know. I don't think you can because it's platform specific. So let's say, okay, well, we have a function template. It's gonna iterate over these values. It's gonna execute this function on it. Here we have to name it because we're not using a type def anymore, but it has basically the same syntax as, oh, sorry, we wanna use T. Uh, sorry, the asterisk has to come first. There, now it's a function object. Now it's a function pointer, I should say. But anybody who knows like, okay, I've done function pointers before. You know, I'm a C programmer. I've seen this happen before. I can extrapolate to applying a function pointer as a template, uh, templated type. Um, so what we can do is we can actually iterate over the values in the list. There's an immutable list of values. It doesn't, we don't know where it's coming from. It could be a vector. It could be um, a sized array or an unsized array. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's just a span, span of numbers of type T. We can use constraints to specify that type T must be, you know, must be able to apply the function to it, but whatever, it doesn't, yeah, not really important for this example. Um, so we need the end result of uh, applying that function to all the objects or to all the uh, values in the array. And we're gonna initialize that, assuming that it has at least <laughs> one value in it. If it doesn't, well, this would break. So maybe I can assert on it to make sure that the values, I don't know, asserts only gonna trigger it uh, uh, in debug mode. I believe its size is greater than zero. Okay, just to make sure that we're not doing something stupid. And then we can just loop over them. And for this, we can just use a what's called a range-based for loop. We want to avoid the copies. Shouldn't primitive data types don't really matter, but whatever. And for some reason, I'm using in my example code. I'm using a subspan, but okay. I'm not sure why. And then we can compute the result by just invoking the function over the result and the current value. Did I call it? Yeah, I called it value and then we return the result. Okay, so you can imagine that if this was an addition and this was a list of integers, that the result of the function would be the sum of all the values in, uh, in the list of integers. You can see where I'm going with this. All right, so we'll use this in an example later. Okay, um, I also wanna show an example of creating a Lambda that can be returned from a function.
Now, again, because we don't know what the type of it is, we need to specify the return type as auto. And then we can, inside a function, we can actually create a lambda. And actually, this is a bit of a weird example because we don't know what x plus y, is, or we don't know what types x and y are. So we can actually create a lambda expression inside of a function and determine, determine its types based on the context in which it is used. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Sure, that's, a, that's possible. Uh, we can also create a lambda that has a function uh, takes ca uh, that captures something. This was all mentioned in the presentation. Uh, in this case, we're going to specify uh, x and y specifically, and what we are capturing is we capture x and y by value. Otherwise, we'd use an ampersand to mention to specify them by reference. But in this case, again. These are temporaries, right? These only exist on the stack because they're being passed by value. So when we call create lambda, they're they're brought into existence, but by the time we return from this function, they no longer exist. So we want to capture them by value because if they were by reference, we'd be referencing deleted values, and that wouldn't be good, right? Okay. So it's a bit weird to see this syntax, but what we're actually returning is the result of the Lambda expression, which contains just a single expression that adds the captured X and Y values. Any questions about that so far? Actually, I should call this create, uh, create capture, but okay. Just to make sure it's clear that we're in this case, we're creating a capture. In that case, we're creating a generic Lambda. And um, OK, the use. Right? So here's an example of using a function pointer. But if we want to pass a Lambda to a function, this is also possible. Um, but like I said, we can do this. But again, what is what type is f, right? We don't know what it is because if we just pass it like this, it's totally possible as long as we know that lambda, or sorry, f is a lambda, which takes two integers and returns an integer, right? But, okay, so this is one way to do it. And in fact, it might not be allocating or it'll probably be one byte on the stack or whatever. But in order to make this a bit more succinct and obvious what it is, I think not succinct, but just more clear, we can use std function. But you see he's not uh, filling it in, but let me just fill this. Uh, we need to include a header file. Um, and this is how we can specify that std function is pointing to a function, a callable function object, which takes an integer or two integers, sorry, and returns an integer. So I'll just include that header file there. Functional, std functional has to be in there. So now we can actually use it. And I guess you can also pass function objects by const reference. But if you are, you know, just creating it in place or passing it, um, it's going to allocate anyways, right? So it's a temporary even if you pass it by reference. So in this case, we probably just intended to actually create by value on the stack anyway. So it doesn't really save us anything in, in some cases. All right, so uh, these are the many ways uh, that we can use lambdas. But of course, you can use them in algorithms and whatever else uh, to create kind of like a in-place function. Um, yeah. Hi, Tap. Okay, he left already, I guess. Uh, but yeah, I'll be uploading this to YouTube. Okay, so let's take a look at a few examples that are actually going to use these uh, functions here. First, we need some kind of values, right? So let's create a, a uh, an array of values. Well, let's say, uh, I don't know, one, two, three, three, four, five. Uh, 
a something like that. So now we have an array of, this isn't now a uh, sized array. So when we compile this, this will be filled in. This is not an unsized array. It'll be filled in with the uh, initial value of uh, five values. And we can use the create lambda function here, which returns it by auto. Um, and we also have to name it auto. And we'll call call it add, because that's all it does, right? It just adds the two values here. Create lambda. All right, so now this should store a lambda. So now when we mouse over, it says lambda, auto, 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 auto. OK, so all of the parameters are going to be determined in based on its context. Um, but we should be clear by what that means. Because if we, for example, try to use this lambda with integers, well, we can just call it like this, 3, 5. Doesn't return it. Uh, let's go SCDC out. I just print the result. And then if we try to go SCDC out, add uh, 3.0, 5.0, Does it allow us to change the type? Probably, actually, let me just try something else. Four, six. And it's probably being evaluated in place. So it's like, OK, it values to 10 because these are constant values. And uh, I can probably just do the expression in place, and I wouldn't have to actually invoke it. So I wasn't, I'm not, I wasn't really sure about whether or not if you use it once with integers and use it again with doubles, you know, when does the actual type get determined? I guess that's on invocation. So here there will be an, a temporary lamb lambda created just to invoke this. Well, probably not because these are constants. And again here, it will it will actually instantiate another lambda which takes doubles instead of integers. So that's interesting. I didn't actually know that. I thought it would give me a warning or an error or something at that point. No, no error. No errors, no warnings. Okay, he's fine with it. Um, yeah, so we can also, for example, pass a lambda to a function with use lambda, and we want to see use lambda. We want to use the add lambda again. And in this case, we're just going to be passing the integers <laughs> until he says, OK, three. Uh, and this should actually invoke the add function with three and five and return eight again. OK, that's passing lambdas by uh, to a function. And we can also iterate over the list using the for each. I wonder if I have to, I think I have to specify Maybe not in C++ 20. No, I don't have to do it in C++ 20. In this case, I'm pass passing the add. No, I do have to do it. OK, I do. Yeah, now he's fine with it. OK, so he couldn't deduce the parameter types for some reason, unless I explicitly specify. Let's see what the error is. Failed to match type. Oh, against int 5, why? Because they're not const. No, I don't know. All right. So if you guys remember, this for each function is a template function which takes some values and some function pointer. And I think I think it's because of this, because it's a auto type deduction, and he can't actually deduce the type here. So we have to explicitly specify the type as integer. And then he's fine with it. So what will be the output of the program? Is the test. Who's still paying attention? <laughs> kind of obvious, I think. What's the result of adding three, three and five? Eight, right. Eight. It should be eight still. In modern, even with using lambdas, it's still eight, right? So it should output eight here. Should. 
10. Yeah, this is just passing the lambda to the use lambda function and executing the lambda. So again, it should be just adding 3 and 5. That should be 8. And this should return, return the, the sum of all these numbers. So what is that? 6, 10, 15? Everyone agree? That's right. Should work, right? Was that out by one? Okay. <laughs> I don't know why it's not coming to the front here. It's somewhere here. Okay, here's the output. It was being uh, included here. 8, 10, 8, yeah, indeed, uh, but 16. So we did something wrong there. I would expect it to be 15, but I guess because we initialized the result with the first value, we actually should have initialized the result with, well, it actually depends on the function because sometimes it should be one, sometimes it should be zero. Um, but anyway, so let's just do zero and the way we specify zero and whatever type T is, so it could be doubles, floats, or whatever, is we just wrap it like this. That actually should have been, yeah. In my own example, I take the, I initialize the result with the first value. That's silly. That's silly. Okay, there it is. Eight, ten, eight, and fifteen. Indeed, yes. So it's working, and we've seen several examples of using lambdas. So other use cases of lambdas are, uh, and one of the actually most common, I think, is um, as comparators to different algorithms. Let's see if I can, I don't know if I can show an example that's not completely um, uh, Just use uh, SD sort. Uh, indeed, but what if you want to change the order of the sort, right? So CPP reference. I mean, you can reference. do that in the uh, Visual Studio, right? Yeah, but I don't want to do it necessarily. I just want to show some examples because there's a huge algorithms library. So there's a lot of different ways to... Um, to apply it, um, and most of them, for example, all of, maybe, let me like see this one, right? So the predicate function. So for every element of an iteration or from beginning to end or first to last, uh, I execute this predicate function. And they're using, again, templates because we don't actually know the type of the predicate. But we have to know that at least, where does it say it? Um, oh, is it P? Uh, yeah, unary predicate, where the expression PV must be convertible to type bool. All right, so this returns, a, if all of them are true, it returns true. Yeah, so this is an interesting example. But here the predicate, which is just a function, a unary function, which takes a single parameter and returns bool, um, can be a lambda expression or another callable function object. All right, so let's see if there's an example of this. Oh, uh, these are possible implementations. Uh, there's partial sum, all of. All right, so here's a lambda expression that checks if all of the values in the list between v begin and const begin, const end are even. Uh, none of. Yes, this is an interesting one. SCD modulus is very likely also a, a lambda expression or a callable function object, which does it just invokes the lambda. Ah, uh, sorry, a modulo on two two operators. Okay, this is a bit yeah, convoluted. These are things I wanted to avoid using placeholders. So yeah, when you bind a function, you can specify that this function is a callable function object, which takes two parameters, which are specified by these placeholders. I suppose I can use two here. Oh no, okay, one of them is a placeholder and the second parameter is always two. So this is the exact same thing as this basically, uh, which if it returns uh, zero, or if it returns true. Yeah, does that module do always always zero? No, I don't know any of them, but anyways. But if none of them are yeah, even, then none of them are, none of them are odd. Why would it be none of them are odd? But anyways, okay, very hard to read. 
All right, so here's some examples anyways. Um, when I say sort, is sorting in here? Uh, should be. It's algorithm, right? Yeah. Partition, sorting operations. Is sort, partial sort, ranges sort, and just regular sort. So in most cases, the, uh, the sorting order is implicit. I think it's always using less than. So lower values will come first. It'll always be ascending. Uh, but we can specify a comparator uh, in the sort function, which allows us to change the order in which they are sorted by. So for example, we could use this to sort objects from distance to our camera. Uh, could be uh, by using a, a lambda with the camera as the object being captured and then iterating over a list of entities in the scene, for example. Ah, it chose one. Sorry? It chose one. It chose one? Yeah, in the, the code example, the last one. This one? Oh, you mean it shows a, an example using a Lambda expression? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So this is quite a simple case where there's nothing uh, being captured here. Uh, so it's just a simple uh, greater than, which just changes the sort order. Right, because the by default, I think it's just using std less, which is also a uh, callable function object, which just takes two parameters and compares if yeah, the left one is less than the right one. All right, so many uses actually. Um, and yeah, basically it's like creating an in-place function. So this is a, also a lambda, result of a lambda expression that just prints the contents of the string view. Separated by spaces, every letter spe separated by spaces. So that's fun. Um, me. Uh, may I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, can we define lambda function for, for example, adding vectors? Or adding two vectors together. Like yeah, and uh, return another vector. Uh, one more time. So if you have two vectors. Like, uh, for example, we have uh, two vectors and we want to uh, add them and return another vector. Like an SD vector or a math vector? Yeah. Uh, ex uh, excuse me? What type of vector? Like the STD vector, like what I'm showing on the screen here? Like, yeah, for example, STD vector. Are they the same size, I wonder? Right, so when you want to have a lambda that, t that can add two vectors together. All right, so what we, well, we can either pass them by parameters, for example. So in this case, we don't need to modify them. And again, uh, vectors can also be passed where a span is expected. And I would actually recommend you start using spans in modern C++ because spans are more, um, let's say, flexible than, uh, than a specific type. So we can pass here not just vectors, but also arrays or just a pointer to an object and the number of objects that we can wrap that in a span. Uh, but let's see how that works. So uh, we want to use SCDP. And in this case, we pass by value because we're not really making any copies. We're just having, it just all contains a pointer to the first element and the number of elements. Right? And so that is our Lambda initializer, right? So we need that to specify, okay, we're defining a Lambda here. Then we have a Lambda that takes two parameters and returns the result of a plus b, right? In another vector, I ask, I wonder? Or how do you want the result to be returned? Uh, yeah, like another vector. OK. Mm -hmm. And in this case, well, we don't need const values because we need to store the result in here, I guess. And I don't know which. We want to initialize the size of it because um, this, there's a problem here that we don't know if these are the same size. So we need to do some error checking or whatever to make sure that you know we don't exceed the length of one of these two. So we have to check whether we're at the end of A or at the end of B. So 
that's a bit annoying, but you want to do like uh, diagonal plus, 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 and then store the result here. Right? I'm just going to assume that that's the case. You don't want to do like 0 yeah, plus 5 like plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9, 1 plus whatever. You could do a bunch of different <laughs> things here. Um, <clears throat> like when working two vectors, you. I thought you meant like adding the two vectors together so you end up with, in this case, one vector of 10 elements. Yeah, yeah. Okay. like vector concatenation. Yeah. No, I mean, like, uh, for example, Add if we have uh, two vectors in 2D space, right? They have two components. And if we add them, we get another vector, which is also two components. Yeah, yeah, so you get x plus x and y plus y. Yeah. Uh, this is something completely different, right? So if this is our vector definition, that's something completely different. Um, yeah, you can totally do this. It's just like any other function, right? So back to a, and much easier because now we know the sizes and so we don't have to try and guess what the sizes of the two vectors are or make sure we don't like exceed oh, yeah. the, it's, the, it's the it's size easy. of one. So if we have this, then, we, then of course, we don't have to do any error checking or anything weird. Uh, we don't even need a loop, right? Because we can even just go, uh, how do we do this? Yeah, um, we don't need to specify the return type, but I guess if we were doing trailing return type, we would say that this Lambda is going to return a VEC2. Uh, yeah, so you can see if I mouse over on it, it says Lambda, it, it returns a VEC2 and it takes two VEC2s by our const reference. Okay, so I think that's, this is called the trailing return type. Now we don't need to really specify that unless we want to do something wacky like this a dot x plus a uh, b dot x and a dot y plus b dot y. So we should, oops, if we say return, we should be able to do that. And since creating a lambda is an expression, we have to terminate this with a semicolon because this is an expression. Okay, so now we have a callable function object uh, that we can use to Later on, like let's say we we do this, we can actually do this. I think in global scope, this is not executing any code. It's just actually defining a lambda. So we can define that in global scope as well. And let's say we had um, vec two a one two and vec two b should three four. And now we can call it add two vectors. A, B. Okay. And then I'll just use a breakpoint just to show that this works. All right. So A has one, two, B has three, four. Um, these haven't been initialized. And our reset result should have four, six. The result is indeed four six. Can you see that? I suppose you can see it. So I, I don't know if this is what you're asking, but yes, here's a lambda expression that can add two vectors. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to know. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it can basically be anything a function could be. Yeah, I wouldn't actually recommending recommend this type of. Uh, approach what i would recommend is you um operator overloading. yes use yeah. operator overloading not, uh... and the thing that's being passed if we want to write it like this is the right hand side so i always denote it all right just for right hand side and since this is really simple uh, function this can also be const because we're not going to modify the result and we just say x plus rhs dot x y plus rhs dot y okay this is a much more succinct way of doing it and then we just have instead of weird lambdas we just do a plus b i am kind of wondering i think it is possible i'm just not sure how you can make lambdas variadic 
and then just sum over each component that way. Oh, possibly, yeah. I was just wondering if I can uh, like create a lambda function for um, vector transformation. Yep. Yep. I mean, sure, that's one transformation you can apply to vectors. Is that what you mean? Well, yeah. Or do you actually mean matrix multiplication like with vectors? Is, uh, like very basic uh, operation. But Honestly, I mean, uh, yeah. I would just use a member function for that. Like yeah. the operator plus thing. Yeah, oh, because yeah. Uh, operators were too simple. Unless you wanted to determine at runtime that the operation that's being performed, but then again, um, maybe a switch statement would even be better. Complex function to uh, transform vectors. Uh, so like to iterate vectors. over like um, like a vertex buffer and perform some kind of multiplication on every element of the x, x some uh, x to some power plus uh, y to some power equals uh, new x coordinate and so on. Yeah, so for example, like you could. Universal. So this is like raised to the power up, but it's exclusive or, I guess. But you could do this, I guess, um, with this type. I don't know if you'd use an integer for this necessarily. I don't know. What do you want to call this? But uh, yeah, that wouldn't use it. I would just put like, make it more expense, uh, explicit. Um, but then I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't do this anymore. I would do back to pow, uh, which takes the cons vect to v, and then I don't know float or integer, and then just. I don't know if this is even correct. How do you take the power of a vector? Well, because the return value is not an integer, unfortunately, uh, I think the pow function takes a double or always returns a double. Or yeah, you need to be, no, there's no pow method that takes uh, integers. So we have to do all kinds of casting, but okay, whatever float, which then casting them back to integers. Uh, yeah. Okay, so integers were not a good example, but let's suppose that these were floats. Float. Like if I understand correctly, instead of power here, I can use like any function. Yeah, of course. So yeah, that's what I need. But this is way yeah. If, if this is sufficient for you, this is way you know really much easier to reason about. Maybe. To take that vector and raise it to the power of three. Um, and this might actually be more, yeah, and it might be easier to read than creating a lambda to do this. I mean, we should use lambdas where they're necessary. And that's why I want to show you the algorithms library, because these are a few situations where lambdas would be, you know, this generates this callable function object, but lambdas would be a good use case for, for example, specifying the, the expression to sort on. Uh, for std sort library, uh, but for things like this, unless you wanted to apply like a generic callable function object to some kind of in some kind of context that's like here do something to some stuff and using this function that would be useful. But in some cases, it's like don't use lambdas just because you can, right? Like there's much yeah, easier ways to add two vectors something. than this. Yeah. Like this is way better because it creates way more easy to read code. I would be like, you can look at this and you say, oh, these two values are being added. That's clear. I know what that does. And I know, I know what it means to add two vectors together. But this, yeah, right? So there's a lot of questions like, do you mean like example, to concatenate the two vectors? Do you mean to apply them like this? Do you mean to apply it like that? Uh, so it's maybe ambiguous or not clear how this is actually, what this is actually doing. Does yeah, that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, just you know, be critical about when you use lambda expressions. 
there should be a reason yeah. for it. I guess you could cast that fact to, to a span of integers, and then you have a generic kind of uh, transformation operation. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. correct. Mm, so let's take this for example. And let's say we want to apply an add function to a vector that takes two values. Now, if I was to take this vector and I wanted to, let's just get rid of this because I still want this to compile. Um, and I'm obviously not doing that right. But let's say I wanted to use the for each on the span. Well, what I need to pass to the span, I don't know if I need single or double braces, but okay, let's try this. A dot x, but we need the address of that value and the number of elements. Um, Can we not instantiate a span by just giving it a pointer and a size? Is it the size of the number of elements, I think? Yeah, so A would be size of int times 2. Yeah, that's what I'm doing, right? Address of the first oh, element sorry, of A yeah, okay, yeah. and the number of elements, which is 2. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. You know what? This is... Uh, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, 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 yeah. So int 2, I think we have to specify the size as the extent. Yeah, that's the dynamic part. And then we just give it the address of the first element, I think. Uh, I don't know why it's complaining about this. I usually just let it instantiate it. No uh, oh, viable constructor. All oh, right, I changed it to I changed it to float. Can I do that? All right, let me look at this. Back to argument float pointer. Might be const now. Cannot convert our value of type float pointer to parameter of type const float. Float pointer does not satisfy uh, const. What was it? <laughs> Concept contiguous range. Ah, oh, okay. Why not? Also, that too could be size of float times two, right? I have to check this. Size of fact two divided by float, I guess. How are we passing spans? I know there is a way to just pass a pointer and the size of that. And you shouldn't have to. So here we have A and B. Here's two um, sized arrays. And just span eight, uh, A8. Yeah, A, and here this is A4, so that's a subspan of A. So can't I just do that? Can't I just okay. leave the template parameters off completely? This is what I initially tried. A oh, and yeah. 2. But then he's like, oh, I don't like that. But that's kind of like what's happening here, right? A4. So A plus 1 here, this is... This is one one element off the first element of the array. Maybe if I go like, let me try this. I know what you're going to say. Unnamed unions. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. An unnamed struct in an unnamed union is an extension. I know, I know. But, but I just want to see. It doesn't matter. It's complaining about float, float pointers. Yeah, but why? In this case, I don't need this anymore. I mean, this will still decay to a pointer, right? This should definitely decay to a pointer, yeah. Uh, but since it's size, I should be able to do this. I should be able to do this. Ugh, I can never get this syntax correct. Takes... No. Uh... Um, seems to be giving me... Oh, wait. IntelliSense is crashing, uh, so I might actually not have problems with this. No, compiler has a problem with it. Could not uh, could be too for wow, that's a very big array. <laughs> yeah, see. yeah, that's uh, if you don't specify the type, it's a the default template parameter for a span is um, 
uh, unbounded extents. No matching function because add. Oh. Does add take an uh, integer? No, right? No, no, is float. These are floats, right? Float, float, float. Everything should be floats. Oh, come on. I'm explicitly specific. Okay. Spans can definitely be tricky, but this technically should work. I shouldn't yeah, have to say. Something wrong, but I think it should work as well. Yeah, I don't get it. All right, let's really be explicit here. Take the address of the first element, please. No, it doesn't like that either. Well, this is uh, unsized now. But if I just pass it like this, this is a sized vector. So we should really know that this is a span of two elements. Could you go back to for each? This one? Yeah. Uh, it's consty. Maybe that's the issue. Oh, and the ad takes integers. So that's maybe that's what it's bitching about. I say everything should be T, but then he's probably going to say like, oh, I can't convert this type the add function to its const int. int. Now he's saying it can't be converted to const int. So let's change add. add. Auto. Hmm? Add, uh, yeah, if we change that to auto, maybe. Arto, come on, you can do it. Oh, it's still squigglies. <laughs> he still doesn't like it. I don't know. You can remove the me. other stuff, I think. Yay, we did it. <laughs> okay, now you can remove the union and struct again, I think. Oh, wait. Maybe if I had this, the return type. Mm. Oh, I don't know. Uh, unit vector. Oh yeah, anonymous fail to match std span const t against. All right, then we really have to specify. I really want floats here, dude. Okay. So what should this be? Three. Why not bookmark that? Oh, that's not uh, bookmark. I guess yeah. Um. You redefined i. Oh damn. They good. Yeah, well, you're not printing it, but sure. Three. Yeah, it's yeah. a bit weird, but yeah, three. One plus two is three. But yeah, it's a bit wonky. But okay. It's a bit of a weird use case, uh, I would guess. And you generally don't uh, iterate over over I mean, um, components of a vector. IOTA, right? Or uh, SCD accumulate? Uh, perhaps. I think it's accumulate. IOTA will generate a, ran, uh, a number range. IOTA is a for loop. Oh, no, ITO. I thought you said ITO. Um, so compute the sum of the given init and the elements in the range first last. So if we could create the iterators, I guess we could use that. I don't know if there's a Ranges. Yeah, you can with a span, right? So, no, I would still need, yeah, span. I would still need to wrap that in a span and then pass the beginning and end iterators of the span to the accumulate function. You can yeah, specify you the use, operator. You could use SED begin and SED end. Pass pointers along. Uh, sure. Yep. Um, but I thought you, okay, but you. Did you say iota? Yeah. Yeah. This generates a range. Is it? Right? So it fills the range uh, from first to last with sequen sequentially increasing values starting with ah. value and repetitively, uh, repeatedly evaluating plus plus value. So the equivalent operation is this until it gets to it. What I was thinking of then. Um, but. Uh, but you were talking about summing values in an array or in a, some kind of a list or something? 
No, that's a cumulate. Uh, yeah. I thought it was basically a for loop, but I guess that's just a CD for each then. Yeah, that's yeah for each. All right, so one of the number of, I think it's four underscore each, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And t t t yeah, this is just another one of those uh, algorithm things. Yeah, it's uh, all for algorithm. each or for each n. Um, which actually, I have a class on it or on algorithms as well. A lesson on algorithms. Let me go back one. But yeah, th these are the main cases for lambdas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As predicates to the functions, these types of functions. But yeah, long story short, um, it's good to know about them, but it's also definitely good to know when you should use them and not necessarily use them just because you can. Oh, and I think that add could also be just replaced by a member function in this case. Um, for which one? Like where you do the vec2 addition now, uh, I think you can just specify vec2 dot operator plus. Oh, to you mean to pass that? But, of the um, lambda. but the lambda does expect two parameters, and the member function operator only has takes one. So uh, wait, you have to define the operator plus outside of the class, which yes. makes it take two. Yeah. Yeah, you could do that too, of course. Which would look something like this. You can do these operators. Um, left hand side. Right hand side. And this you have to do, for example, if you want to, let's write a vector scalar where the left hand side is a float S and the right hand side is a vector. Then you would say S times RHS dot x and s times rhs dot y so this would be a vector scalar where you have to declare it in global scope because you cannot create over operator overloads for floats and in this case the left hand side is this structure and the right hand side is the one you passed uh, on the right hand side of the plus operator but when you want to allow vector scale uh, scales with a float on the left side Totally valid. Totally makes sense to do so. So do it, and then. But you have to exp you have to provide those functions like this. But yes, if you had a global operator plus that takes a left hand side and right hand side, then you can use that as a standard free function to pass to uh, the place where uh, either a function object or a function pointer is expected, such as here. If that makes sense. Which might also be implicit for certain operations. What like mean? accumulate. Implicit being that it takes two parameters and returns a single. Uh, as in you don't have to specify the lambda or predicate at all. All right. Yeah, well, that the default is std add. Yeah, because it has operator plus overload. Oh, OK, yeah. Do plus. I have plus, right, exactly. So basically, yeah, this is just the <laughs> what we just defined called add, but yeah, STD has a version of this to, that does exactly the same thing. Well, I think um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, all the SD less, greater, plus, etc., are special yeah. cases because they don't call the overloads, uh, which is why when you want to take an address of something, you actually should be using as the address of instead of the ampersand because okay. the ampersand might be overloaded. Um, yeah, okay, fair enough. But I think the only exception is the address of operator because it's so weird that you can overload that and get a completely different value than what you expect. So when STD implementations have that, they use STD address of to avoid the invocation of the overloaded operator which could be defined on the type. But I think in most cases for standard operators, they do not do anything to try to avoid the call of the overloaded operator. Whereas in this case, if T was the VEC2 type, it would call plus, and whichever ones it finds, either the plus operator defined on the structure itself or one that matches in global scope, 
it will use those. Hmm. Yeah, so that's one exception, right? The address off. So, but any other operator, I'm ninety-nine percent sure there aren't any weird, you know, alternative <laughs> implementations of this. So, how how could you, for example, you know, add these two together without invoking the actual operator? How would you know how to add these together? We don't even know what these are. These could be strings. These could be vectors. They could be three component vectors, four component vectors. These could be matrices. We don't know. Yeah, so the I'm only sure way. As I was saying, because like you can't overload the plus operator on like a float or any other primitive, so it doesn't make sense for that as well. Yeah. So, but if T is a float or an integer, well, that still works. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, I don't think it does anything weird to avoid actually invoking the member, the operators that might be defined on the on the type itself. Only for the address of, but yeah, that was a, I don't know, another more advanced uh, use case. Uh, hmm, we're getting off track, but um, so it's not, it's really not recommended to overload the ampersand operator on a type. So in this case here, we have a struct called pointer, which tries to act like a pointer type, but it overloads the the address of operator to give you back the actual, well, it should actually return just the pointer the to the data. Number. Yeah, this is the non const version. So, and this way it allows you to actually change the pointer, but there should be a const pointer or a const uh, version of this, which point, which just returns data. Then you can only return the actual or set the data, but you can't change what it points to. But anyway, so this is actually a bad, a bad example of you know using this and faking that this is actually a pointer to type so to circumvent this if we really want the address of p we have to use std address of and otherwise we're going to get the address of data actually the address of the address of data just <laughs> okay but yeah this is how we can prevent invoking the ampersand operator on a type or on an instance of a variable. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit tired here. And we're getting off track. Um, but yeah, C++ is complex. Bottom line, I guess. Any questions? Anyone left? Anyone still awake? By the way, why is it yeah, I'm called still Lambda? Awake. Why is it called Lambda? <laughs> Was that your question? Yeah. That's a very good um, question. This, yeah, it is based on the Greek lambda, Greek letter of the alphabet. But I what does that actually mean? Lambda, but not alpha, not beta. Yeah. I, the I think voice... it's really called lambda because, like, what was it, Haskell or Pascal or some old language used lambda? So we kind of took it from there? Yeah. You know what? I have these, like, little tidbits of information in some of my slides about why is it, for example, IOTA. IOTA was one of these things. History yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. What's terrible? All the, all the Greek letters, they, they don't describe what the function does. No. Wow, no, but... we have gamma function, beta function. Yeah. But, I mean, these are just letters of the Greek alphabet. So, like, okay, this is the one from, I guess, Valve's... Uh, what's it called? Oh, because it's derived from lambda <laughs> calculus. Half-Life? Half-Life, that's the one. Looks like Half-Life, but apparently uh, Amazon Web Services Lambda kind of stole it. But anyways, um, Lambda Calculus, yeah. Which is kind of synonymous with how Lambdas work, so. Um, should I ask ChatGPT? Why Lambda function is used in C++? No, that's not what I want to know. I want to know why is it called Lambda? <laughs> Lambda is named after the function from Lambda calculus and programming. Those functions act as a good analogy for the service. In Lambda, you write a function and connect it to other services such as API gateways, S3. Okay, well, this is Lambda now in uh, Amazon Web Services, I guess. What is a Lambda function in C++ with name? What? Okay. Yeah. 
Sure, 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 sure. But anyways, why is the sky called sky? <laughs> why is the lambda function called lambda? Yeah, from, yeah, I guess, lambda calculus. But why did they call it lambda calculus? Maybe alpha, gamma, and beta were already taken. Alpha, what is it? Alpha, beta, gamma? Is gamma the third alpha letter of the Greek alphabet? I don't even know. So there's a few, uh, yeah, there's a few letters of the Greek alphabet that are used throughout programming. Uh, what was the other one? Um, well, tau, but uh, gamma, gamma's used quite a bit. Gamma correction, gamma rays, I don't know. Uh, sigma for addition, lambda. Yeah, like sigma for uh, four loops. That's also something. Yeah. Epsilon for small values. Uh, theta for, well, angles, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh, sigma is used for sum. Also, there is a big pi notation of uh, factorial. Like that's a bit of math. But uh, so the lambda calculus is universal in the sense that any computable function can be expressed and evaluated using this formalism. So it, it basically ends up with uh, small functions, basically. Um, which makes sense why it's called lambda and C++ because it's derived from lambda calculus. But then why is lambda calculus called lambda calculus? Yeah, exactly. We go on forever about this. But anyways, it makes sense now. Does it? Um, yeah, this was another one. This is a C++ name, which is it's really a bizarre name iota of the function. And I thought this was quite interesting how it came up. Um, but in some programming languages, the literal uh, the literal lowercase iota symbol is used in the programming language to mean a sequence of numbers. And it generates, well, as you would imagine, lambda, or sorry, uh, iota 4 gives a list 1, 2, 3, 4, which is interesting. And in C++, in C++ IOTA does the same thing. It generates, well, it fills a sequence with values. You can specify the starting value in the C++ SCD IOTA. So I, I thought that was this kind is, of... It's really the first time I see IOTA is getting used. Yeah. So go to the uh, page for Lambda. Uh, well, lambda Calculus, okay. On yeah, Lambda Calculus, a, okay. So then on Wikipedia, you see in the history, the origin of the lambda symbol, yeah. the symbol. Uh, and then the uh, last sentence. Just here or? I know the, the origin of. Um, yeah. Origin of uh, here? And last sentence. According to Scott, uh, Scott who? Uh, Dana Scott? Yeah. Sure. According to Scott, Church's entire response consisted of returning a postcard of the following annotation. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. What? Is that yeah, what you want me to read? <laughs> In the book. Maybe the whole part, because I think there's something about lambda here. Uh, so there's some uncertainty over the reason why churches use the Greek letter lambda as a notation for function abstraction in the lambda calculus, perhaps in part due to the conflicting explanations by church himself. I guess there was a reference to somebody named Church before here. According to Cardone and Hindley, by the way, why did Church choose the notation lambda in an unpublished 1964 letter to Harold Dixon? He stated clearly that it came from the notation x hat used for class abstraction by Whitehead and Russell. By first modifying x hat to, oh, what is this, the all of x symbol for all x, to distinguish function abstraction from class abstraction and then changing all of to lambda for ease of printing. Interesting. Yeah, so this is a, this as far as I know, this is a time. Boolean notation, which which indicates that all of x, uh, any of is a v, I think, in lambda no and Boolean notation. The origin was also reported in Rosser 1984 on page 338. On the other hand, in his later years, Church told two inquirers that the choice was more accidental. A symbol was needed and lambda just happened to be chosen. Dana Scott also, also addressed this question in various public lectures. Scott recounts that he once posed a question about the origin of the lambda symbol to Church's former student and son-in-law, 
John W. Edison Jr., who then wrote his father-in-law a postcard, Dear Professor Church. Russell had the IOTA operator. Hilbert had the Epsilon operator. Why did you choose Lambda for your operator? According to Scott, Church's entire response consisted of returning the postcard with the following annotation. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. <laughs> okay, so he chose it randomly. That's what he means. Like he basically just counts his fingers. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Catch it, take it by his toe. If he always let him go, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. So he chose it fairly randomly. And that's why we now call lambda functions lambdas. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Well, as I assumed, it was chosen randomly, just completely. Yeah, it's arbitrary. I guess it's arbitrary. I mean, like, same reason. Why, why do we call blue color? You know, why, how do we come up with a name for colors? Or why do we call it grass? Because we called orange orange because the orange fruit was orange. Well, exactly. But what came first, the, f the fruit or the color? The fruit. Are you sure? I, actually, yeah. <laughs> if you're considering physics, then color. All right. We're getting way off topic for the recording. So uh, where are we at now? One hour, 36 minutes. But I'm going to do a quick sign off. All right, so thank you very much for, <laughs> for joining. And don't forget to like and subscribe and uh, join the Discord server. Um, yeah, see you next time.